to hear a lot about innovation today. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the underlying values that enable successful creative collaboration and innovation. Um, but first, I'm going to show you some of the defining work of one of the great artists of our time. And when I'm showing you these images, I want you to think about why you do what you do. What influences you? What do you value most? And what are the values that determine what influences you? This is the Temple of Juno by David Best and a crew of several hundred people who built it over a summer out in a desert in Nevada. It looks like something you might find at Anchor Wat. It's really beautiful, it's amazing. Except that it's made entirely of intricately cut wood. It's also designed to be something that you participate in. You adorn it with your own stories because it's a temple to mourning loss and letting go of loss and to celebrating life. So we live in a world where we value most things by putting a number on it, by putting a price tag on it. And we think about art. In the art world, we say, how much did it sell for? Or who's the celebrity who made that, that art? Or if it's a company, we say, how much is the company worth? And who's the entrepreneur? And how much money did they make? How much is that person worth? But with this art, none of that applies. You can't buy it. It's not for sale. In fact, you can't even see it ever again. And this is why. It's all been burned back to the dust. Now, for me, this was a very provocative, intriguing concept that people would work so hard, hundreds of people working together over an entire summer and spend so much effort to make something so beautiful and then to just burn it. And it was really provocative in the sense of thinking about why am I doing what I'm doing? Why are these people doing what they're doing? Now, when I asked you the question, why are you doing what you're doing, I'm curious how many of you had somewhere in the back of your mind, or you would like to be able to answer that question, that I'd like to make a difference in the world. I want to make the world a better place in some way. Well, you're in, you're in good company because when you go to TED or watch TED Talks, this TED stage is full of people talking about how they want to make a world a better place and make a difference. This is Bill Gates answering the same question from Chris Anderson. Why, do you, why are you doing what you're doing? And his answer is, I want to focus on the biggest global inequity. And this is Larry Page, the founder of Google. Same question from Charlie Rose. Why are you doing what you're doing? I want to make the world a better place. I want to make it better. And it's very encouraging that people with great wealth and capacity and power say things like that. But I'm curious, if you're really honest with yourself, how many of you had the thought in your mind, that's great for them, but I actually need to pay the rent. Or I need to put food on the table, or I need to take care of my kid. I can't afford to think about things like this. That's kind of a high class challenge. I'll do that later after I've taken care of business. And I was in that boat too, and I think it's, um, it's a trap that lots of us fall into. I will do something meaningful later after I do the things I have to get done first. And that later is after I've been able to achieve something or have some kind of success or get to some point um, in my life. It's a little bit like our value system is ordered along the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. At the bottom is survival. We need to get by. And at the top, the things we celebrate, the innovation and the creativity and all of the great things, that's reserved for when we've already covered all of our bases. And I think that that's actually a trap and a challenge. And we have our, we celebrate, we call them celebrities, but the celebrities are on top and they become the heroes in our society. And I want to talk about why I think that that's actually not a healthy ecosystem and that's not what inspires creativity and innovation and it's actually not the way nature works. So in my own story, I answered that question the same way. I want to make the world a better place, and I want to do something good, and I also want to be successful and make a company that's going to be successful financially. And I started a company that was solving a problem in healthcare 
how do we create a better model of care for people with chronic illness? How do we monitor people at home rather than waiting for the crisis to happen and treating them in the hospital? So this was our mission statement. We worked for Wally. Wally was like an example of one of the, one of the patients who used our system at, at the Veterans Affairs. And it, and it really worked. It really helped pe pe keep people out of the hospital. All of the barriers and struggles and challenges we went through a, as a company were related to the financial incentives in the system. Even though the United States spends more on healthcare than anyone else in the world by, a, by an extremely wide margin, the answer you always get is that we can't afford to spend money on things that might help keep the people out of the hospital, although tons of money changes hands when there's a crisis and people end up in the hospital. So I ended up testifying before congressional committees and governments and trying to get the rules changed. And that's what this is on the right, which is one of those, one of those many testimonies. Then I met this guy, Patrick Manika, the guy in the middle holding the, the piece of paper. I was in Rwanda in 2007, going to TED Global with a group of people from, from TED because Clinton's TED Prize wish was about building a model of care in Rwanda. And so a bunch of people from TED went saying, how can we help? Because we're coming from a wealthy country, we should be able to help. And I find Patrick Manika, who survived the genocide in Rwanda at 13, became a soldier, missed the bus to Congo to join the war there, and ended up working for Partners in Health, taught himself how to speak English, taught himself how to use computers, and ended up running, building and operating and running the electronic medical record system using open source technologies. And he was implementing a model of care with Paul Farmer and the people of Partners in Health, where people like the woman on the left were every day going and monitoring patients at home, reporting back problems, keeping people cared for better at home. Um, and they had an electronic medical record to track everything. And the piece of paper in his hand is actually a printout from the electronic medical record. So here I was in a country with no resources, no infrastructure, and the homes of people with mud huts and no running water. And they had an electronic medical record system and a health monitoring model of care that I thought was better than what we were doing with tons of venture capital in the most wealthy healthcare system in the world in the United States. I was blown away. I learned more in one day from Patrick Manika in Rwanda than in the prior 15 years working with the top experts and leaders in the US healthcare system. I went back home, we ended up selling the company, and then this company that I had built to last and make a difference sort of no longer existed. Um, and then the financial crisis of 2008 and all of that came along and the various corruptions in the banking system, and I realized I actually didn't have any money either. And so I was back to square one. I was like a student uh, graduating from college with a big student loan. The difference was I had three kids and a wife and a lot of responsibilities, but I was back to square one. So I knew I was doing something wrong. I knew I had not figured out the value system. Making the world a better place is not enough of a core value to know you're doing the right thing, especially if you think you need to get ahead first before you can, you can do something. Then I met this guy who's the Larry Harvey, the founder of Burning Man, and he kind of laughed at that idea that I would ever have permission to do what I wanted to do because of resources or being successful. And he had created and let, was leading an organization that had an event every year out in the desert in Nevada um, that was based on the idea that you could truly be yourself without any of the values of the world, without any money and status and power and, and all of that, um, but you could truly be yourself without judgment. And of course, if you tell 60,000 people you can go out to a remote desert and truly be yourself without judgment, a lot of crazy things happen that you're not necessarily going to write home to your mom about. <laughs> but you also see all kinds of self-expression from individual scale, like the flamethrower tuba player wearing a kilt, to grand projects like a recreation of the Trojan horse um, with room for an army inside, but actually repurposed as a bar. 
and being towed across the desert by a whole marching band full of flame-throwing tuba players. <laughs> and I thought that was pretty extraordinary. And then you also find, with a lot of frustration in the financial system, in which I'd personally felt uh, as well, um, people building a whole recreation of Wall Street so they could occupy it and then sing in the 99% chorus and then burn it to the ground. And the guy who actually led this project and put this together, an extremely ambitious, difficult project, he was a, a war veteran, a, a disabled, unemployed war veteran who in the default world, as they call it in Burning Man, the world that we live in every day, not valued very highly. But in this world that's valuing learning and creating and collaborating around art, was doing an extraordinary thing. And of course, there's a TEDx out there, and that's how it actually brought me, that's how I ended up becoming a filmmaker. I, I, brought, I was a tech entrepreneur, and I, but I had to bring the uh, film crew to Burning Man to film our TEDx Black Rock City. Um, and after going through all the hoops to do that, I said, we're going to film all week long for a documentary, which turned into a feature film that came out last year and premiered here in Hong Kong last couple of days. You also find some of the most extraordinary art in the world, like Truth is Beauty by Marco Cochran. Um, and to get an idea of just how big this is, the scale of this kind of art, those are the feet. And it's truly extraordinary. You pull the camera back, and you see their truth is beauty is, is again in sort of the lower right. And you see that there are thousands and thousands of things going on like this. And you pull the camera back further and you think about the network of people and how they are interacting with each other. It looks kind of like this, although this is actually the picture of all the connections on the internet. And the connections, if you think of the connections between people on a network like this, what constitutes those lines between people? That's influence. Who's influencing whom and why? And you realize that what influences you is a function of what you value. If you value money and status and power, then people with more of it have influence over you, more than they should. But if you value learning and creating and collaborating, you have a very different network. In fact, you take 17 people and you form a collaboration and you say we're going to do something, but if you orient it around status and money and power, you end up, inherently you end up with a hierarchy. There are people with more and people with less. And the people at the bottom of the hierarchy just turn out to be the people that build everything and take care of the kids and create all of the food. I mean, they're ones that kind of make our system work. They're at the bottom of the hierarchy. And the heroes are at the top. But if you reorient your world and your network around a different set of values, like learning and creating and collaborating, the shape of the network is very different. And it actually looks a lot more like nature. You take the Amazon rainforest, the network of all of the life cycle and the net looks the same as that scale-free network that is the internet or is the human network that's oriented around values like creating and collaborating. But here's what we do as human beings. We say, let's reorient that network around our values and what happens. We go from the beautiful, amazing network of nature to a monoculture. And our reason is we have to eat. Seven billion people on this planet, we have to eat. But the fact is, this isn't even going to be for food. It's going to be for biofuels. And we see this all over. We take the beautiful, priceless network of nature. This is Kate Brooks in a film she's doing about poaching, and we commodify it, and we put a value on it, it ends up being a pile of trinkets. This is a Victorian egg collection, kind of the same thing. Take this beautiful nature and make it, and make it into a static, dead object. These are all subjects of films that we're working on now. One thing you can say about values is if you stop valuing money, status, and power, they, never have, they no longer have power over you. It's the source of all activism is people saying, you know what, I'm not going to value that anymore, I'm going to value something else. This is from a movie we're coming out with in the fall. He's about to get arrested for watering plants in an urban farm. So the scale-free values are ones that are not hierarchical. They're not ones where some people have more and other people have less. When it comes to learning and creating and innovation, diversity is the key to innovation. Having connecting diverse perspectives, 
Learning can happen anywhere on the network. And in a collaboration, everyone is valuable to make a big project happen. So back to David Best, who is the designer of the temple at Burning Man. That temple no longer exists. It's been burned to the ground. But the cycle renews because art is not about the artifact that we can collect or somebody can have in a collection or put a price tag on. Art is about that process of creating and learning and growing. And this is really the heart of Burning Man is the temple. And David Best is doing the temple again this year. And one of the great events in the community with the temple is revealing the design of the new temple. And David Best, so I was going to give this talk here, and he gave me, he gave me the design of his new temple that is just going to start being built next week by hundreds of volunteers over the whole course of a summer. And let's see what it actually looks like. So this one might be burned to the dust. But this is, this is what renewal and regeneration looks like. So, so starting next week, another group of hundreds of volunteers are going to get together and they're going to build something priceless and beautiful and they're going to do it because of the process of creating and collaborating. And whether they are somebody cooking the food for the army of people that are going to go out into a harsh environment and build this, or there's somebody carrying the lumber, or they're an artist or designer, they're all part of an invaluable creative collaboration on, on creating something beautiful. And the kind of values that make that possible are very different from the values of the world that we often find ourselves in. But those are the values that are the key, I believe, to a really meaningful life on this planet. Thank you.